young men, both from northern Colorado, the first and last Coloradan killed in war. This Memorial Day, we remember them and every service member who has made the ultimate sacrifice. What America now defines as sacrifice is when we can go back to breweries and the mall again. We just happen to have news on both fronts tonight. Stories of hate crimes during the pandemic do not match up with reports of hate crimes during the pandemic. Let's take a closer look. And the law that was lifted during the stay home era that could become a constant. It would change the way Colorado drinks. Raise a toast, because this is next. Restaurants can reopen to dine-in customers on Wednesday. Governor's announcement allows 50% capacity, but no more than 50 people in the place. Denver says it, it will follow those state guidelines. Jeffco and Tri-County Health are going to do the same thing. It means that bars will stay closed and breweries, they'll have to get creative. Here's Steve Stager. We want to do this safe. We want to make sure that we do this responsibly. But most of all, they want to do it. Business here at Joyride Brewing in Edgewater is down 70% year over year. While the adult lemonade stand out front is working, it's not paying the bills. So we're really, really happy that we could come together uh, to an agreement where we could be lumped together with the, the restaurants. Or Dave Bergen is also the chair of the Colorado Brewers Guild, a group that had to push the governor's office hard, reminding them that a lot of breweries have a lot of space and they could follow the same guidelines as restaurants. We always knew that this was gonna be more like a dimmer switch than an on off switch. And so it's good that we're starting to kind of turn that dimmer a little bit. This phase of the dimmer switch will only allow a brewery, winery, distillery, or bar to open if they have a kitchen on site, if they partner with a food truck, or if they partner with a restaurant nearby. A rule that means a lot of these businesses are going to have to get creative. We'll take care of them. They'll take care of us. It'll work out great. Providence at 5280 is a tavern down the street from Joyride. Bergen and Providence owner Cody oh, Ford okay. have worked out a deal. The tavern will be the go-to restaurant for the brewery, able to fill in gaps when food trucks aren't there. We can have a, a doorman or a bar back or someone like that run that food down to them. Being able to offer people some, some choice uh, between um, the restaurant and the truck, I think, is uh, going to be good for us. Joyride and other breweries are effectively becoming temporary restaurants. Just the latest thing you'd never expect in this age of COVID-19. So do you have to order food? Guidance doesn't say. It does say that breweries can't just skirt around this by heating up a microwave pizza for you or telling you to get on your app and, and order something on Grubhub. Joyride is making some major changes inside their tap room. They are moving to a reservation system so that they have a database of people that they can contact in case there's an outbreak. Kyle, it's going to look a whole lot different if you choose to venture out and head to a brewery. So as we think about the safety aspect of it, do we have a good idea of why they think that sitting down and ordering food is safer than sitting down and ordering a drink? We have asked the governor's office about this. They say that you can feasibly follow health guidelines in the dine-in setting, and then they have to reevaluate things. We haven't really gotten a straight answer about that. That is a question. You could think that when you drink, your inhibitions tend to go down, and then you wonder about social distancing from there. I think there are going to be some people who have to get shoveled out of restaurants who might run into that exact same problem. All right, <laughs> Steve Stager, thank you very yeah. much. The, the state is uh, state's allowing Park Meadows Mall in Lone Tree to reopen this weekend after two months of time closed. Our Ryan Hare takes a look at what it's like to shop in a mall during a pandemic and how the shutdown has impacted malls that already had an uncertain future. We really converted the shopping center over to being completely touchless. Everywhere you'll see sanitizers, you'll also see the reminder to be distancing six foot. Park Meadows also, Senior General hard. Manager Pamela Kelly says there's also lots customers don't see. They use special antibacterial cleaning technology and now use special air filters to better protect guests. Security guards are sticklers about masks and only a few stores are open right now. 
more and more will open each day and um, that was always what the plan was was to be gradual and this is the completely empty food court all of these restaurants are closed and park meadow says they likely won't reopen until they get additional guidance on how to do so safely here's the other thing all these tables there are no chairs at them they do not want people sitting and staying Experts say these strange times should be spent by retailers making sure they're being relevant after decades of overbuilding. Simply put, we have too many damn stores, Ryan. Darren Duber Smith, senior lecturer of marketing at MSU Denver, anticipates 25 to 30 percent of brick and mortar stores won't exist in five to 10 years. You can't just put a bunch of stores together and say, hey, everybody show up and shop. Um, you know, we have web browsers that can do that. So shopping malls really have to sort of think outside the box and offer more experiences. And those experiences can be tough to have with the mask and social distancing. Park Meadows expects some stores will adapt and hang on, and naturally others won't. You'll see a weeding out, you'll see um, retail change, but we've seen retail change. You know, you have Microsoft and Apple and Tesla and Peloton, you know, the type of retail is much more active than what it was. So what's it like to go to a mall during a pandemic? Well, kind of like it was before, except most people are in a mask and you're asked to social distance. Of course, only 39 of the more than 200 stores are open in this mall right now. So I imagine social distancing gets a bit more complicated as more stores start to open up. The Park Meadows management says they will maintain 50% capacity throughout all of this. For next, I'm Ryan Harris. Ryan has tremendous diction, even with a mask on. Anecdotal stories are piling up of Asian Americans targeted during the pandemic, but the number of stories do not match the number of actually reported hate crimes in Colorado. The Boulder County DA says they have not seen an increase. Anti-defamation league said they haven't gotten a lot of reports either. Their concern, though, is that perhaps people just aren't coming forward. A lot of it is uh, a lot of racial slurs of people being avoided. There have been some instances of people um, getting spit on, um, of people being sprayed with disinfectant. I think it's also important for law enforcement to be able to track and tell if there's trends going on. The groups that follow hate crime numbers encourage that reporting so, one, they have an accurate picture of what's happening, and then two, to potentially stop low-level harassment from turning into more dangerous situations. We are going to skip our usual daily report on the number of Coloradans hospitalized for COVID-19. Hospital Association tells us today that about a, qu a quarter of hospitals did not report their totals due to the holiday weekend. So while the state health department did put out numbers, they're artificially low and they're not accurate. So we're going to resume that daily reporting when the full totals come in. We do get a look at testing, though. And after processing more than 6,000 tests on Friday, numbers have come back down to where they had been for quite a while in the range of 3,500 or 4,000 tests per day statewide. This is well below Colorado's testing goal. But as we discussed on Friday, we do at least seem to be approaching on the front range the threshold where everyone who wants a test is able to get one. Jefferson High School, by the numbers, it struggles. Low academic ratings, high poverty, declining enrollment. Look behind the numbers. Look beyond them at that school in Edgewater, and you see something a lot more rich. For more than a year, our reporter Nelson Garcia and photojournalist Ann Herbst have shared stories from students and teachers at Jefferson High, giving all of Colorado a look inside their lives from the first day of school to the last. I would say my biggest hope for this is that people see us for who we really are and see that we're not that ghetto school anymore, that we're just a big family. Some powerful stories about challenges in life and triumphs. I invite you to join me in watching the Nine News original documentary tonight at 7 p.m., The Jefferson Project. Again, that's 7 o'clock on Channel 20. On a day when there are no ceremonies scheduled anywhere because of what we're living through right now, look at the people that still come. We remember the first and the last Coloradan killed in war and the thousands of names in between as the pandemic forces more individual reflection this year. What's good for the Grey Goose is good for the gander, but what's good for restaurants during the pandemic could wipe out a lot of liquor stores in Colorado. That's next.
Fred Springstead and Gabe Condi were young men separated by one year in age and 120 years in time. Private Springstead and Specialist Condi, the first and the last Coloradans killed in combat. Springstead in the Philippines in 1898, Condi in Afghanistan in 2018. Two young men whose mothers were told their sons were not coming home. Private Fred Springstead of the 1st Colorado Regiment, killed in Manila during the Spanish-American War. Small note in the papers at the time. The first man in a Colorado regiment to be killed in action. A fellow soldier told the newspaper he was tall and exposed his head too long at a time. He was 21. His mother Jane wrote, All my hopes lie buried in that far distant grave. Army Specialist Gabe Condi of Berthet killed on a mission to provide security for U.S. Special Operations Forces targeting terrorists in Afghanistan. Coloradans lined the road home for his procession. He was 22. His mother Donna said, Gabe was passionate about helping the weak, the abused, and the innocent. They are among the 6,000 names of Coloradans lost in war at the Colorado Freedom Memorial in Aurora. Memorial Day here is the whole run of emotions you could imagine. It honors all Colorado veterans killed in action since we became a state. So from Spanish-American War through today, over 6,200 names here. We keep uh, alive their stories, their names, and provide a place where they'll never be forgotten. They get a sense of just how many 6,200 is, right? And what a debt we owe that that many of our brothers and sisters from Colorado would leave to go to defend freedom around the world. They come away with an understanding that uh, Memorial Day should be remembered and commemorated on a day when there are no ceremonies scheduled anywhere because of what we're living through right now. Look at the people that still come. Isn't it a sign of the world that we live in that, that we came out and placed arrows in the sidewalk? Uh, we made some six foot spacing markers up in front of the memorial, but it was important to us that they knew they could still come, that they could still be here, that we couldn't let this weekend go without an opportunity to commemorate what it was all about. For those families to know that in the midst of everything else everybody's dealing with, their sacrifice means a great deal and was not to be forgotten. And I think maybe in the simplicity of this Memorial Day, we're finding its true meaning. Have a grateful Memorial Day. Be grateful that these heroes lived. And for you Gold Star families whom grateful doesn't mean a whole lot to hear have a grateful Memorial Day, I, I'd hope that you'd find some comfort in this day. People wanted to go someplace and uh, we're, we're glad they're coming here. Kathy Sabin, and we have a wild week of weather coming up from an inch of rain, cool, cloudy conditions to maybe 90 later this week. Our super soaker is off to the east of us. This system kept temperatures cool, 10 degrees cooler than average today. But we start the warming trend tomorrow. As this low moves east, the high pressure sets up. Temperatures are going to sort of seasonal levels and then into record territory. Isolated showers earlier than clearing, low 43. Tomorrow, sunny and 75. Warmer Wednesday with afternoon thunder showers, cooler Thursday. Could see highs close to 90 over the weekend with isolated storms Saturday and Sunday and low to mid 90s early next week. Memorial Day weekend snow is about as Colorado as an apple pie edible. A fresh coat of high country powder and the holiday today. It all has meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen feeling poetic and patriotic. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. Fresh coat of freedom. The beauty they protected, mountain majesty. That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat. Remember Denver's two hour prohibition led to a run on liquor stores in March? The mayor quickly backed off as people lined up outside liquor stores thinking that they were just gonna have to grab what they could before they stayed home. 
Our booze rules have changed in a lot of ways, though. The governor's executive order is allowing restaurants to serve takeout alcohol and delivery alcohol from places like breweries. State legislators are looking at keeping it that way. Our Marshall Zellinger examines the impact of yet more competition for Colorado's liquor stores. Memorial Day weekend is normally a busy time to run a liquor store. Things are fine here. We have a very loyal customer base. Tobin Hayes owns Hugo's Colorado Beer and Spirits off 13th Avenue in Capitol Hill. He now has competition from the restaurant next door that gets to serve to-go alcohol during the COVID-19 emergency. We're certainly sympathetic to restaurants. We've already gotten the squeeze from having grocery stores being able to sell uh, alcohol. So, I mean, that would be just a double whammy for us. As we told you last week, Republican Senator Kevin Priola wants to allow restaurants to continue to sell takeout alcohol, extending the governor's month-to-month -month executive order. The draft of the bill would have basically the governor's executive order expire July 1st of 2022. Liquor stores fought grocery and convenience stores for a decade until state law changed on January 1st, 2019, allowing grocery and convenience stores to sell full strength beer. Now, for two months, the governor has given restaurants the okay to sell takeout and delivery alcohol. For us being able to actually sell that to go has helped a lot. At Los Dos Patrios in Centennial, the margaritas are ready to go. If we just keep it to straight cocktails, I think we're not going to be competing with liquor stores. If someone wants to come and grab a margarita, Great, they can buy a margarita, but we're not going to sell them a bottle of tequila to go. The Colorado Restaurant Association reports that 87% generate revenue from alcohol, and one in five restaurants currently makes almost all of its revenue from alcohol. We did take a regression because of uh, COVID-19, but if they do allow this to continue on for the next couple of years, we potentially might be able to make back what we ended up losing. Potentially good for restaurants, not so great for liquor stores. The law needs to be really clear on what they can do and how long they can do it. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. This appears to be a remarkably thirsty state. Because of how far lawmakers are already into this extended legislative session, Republican State Senator Kevin Priola would need permission from the Democrats in charge of the chamber in order to introduce a bill this late. A century from now, people are going to be like, so how did great grandpa die? Oh, well, he got trampled by a bison while grabbing some great photos for the gram. It's not how you Colorado. And your feedback next. Getting close enough to a herd of bison that they can look you in the eye? That's not how you Colorado. Mike sent us these photos of a guy at Rocky Mountain Arsenal over the weekend. Looks like he's no more than 20 to 30 feet away from that herd of bison. Do you know how fast a bison can run? No, neither do I. And I bet you that guy doesn't know either. And with those calves around, he might have ended up on the business end of a bison real fast. A real reminder for the rest of us. It's not how you Colorado. We give wildlife room. Tina says that they went out to dinner the other night in Highlands Ranch. Says it wasn't crowded. Everybody wore a mask. They wore one anytime they were away from the table. And she said it was amazing getting out of the house to have a meal. Ruth Ann, though, writes in, says that she has zero plans to go out to eat. She says this is largely an experiment in viral transmission. Brenda brings up a good point, which is how are businesses with a 250-person capacity supposed to survive? 50 is the cap for now. D says, Jefferson. Jefferson High is my alma mater. Graduated 47 years ago. Thanks for honoring a school with a lot of history and a proud community that's come on hard times. That Nine News original documentary airs at 7 p.m. on Channel 20, and I'll see you next time.